Ni hao, and welcome to episode five of my Mao's China vlog. And um, this time we're talking topic two, which is all about the economy um, in Mao's China. Um, and because of that, uh, the main sort of overriding theme here is change and continuity. How successful was Mao and the CCP generally in transforming the Chinese economy, which was um, in a bad state um, in 1949? Uh, through to 1976. Um, so the first uh, first of our episodes here, we're going to think about agriculture uh, between 1949 and 1957. And really, this is the process by which Mao begins to take control of um, agriculture uh, in the People's Republic of China and develop it towards uh, being more communist. So. Um, before the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP had even got control of China, they had redistributed land in the areas that they had um, had uh, authority over. So they already had a pattern for how to implement their agricultural policy. Richer peasants who had owned land uh, but hadn't rented it out in those areas were not targeted. Um, but those uh, people who had rented it out and had been landlords uh, were targeted. This is quite a popular policy, particularly amongst peasants, um, and this was the basis of the approach that the CCP took once the whole country was under communist rule after 1949. Hence, in 1950, the passing of the Agrarian Reform Law, which laid down the legal framework under which this land reform would take place. The CCP claimed that it would um, end the exploitation of peasants by what was called the landlord class and was a first step towards providing the resources required for industrialization. So just like in Soviet Russia, um, agriculture and industry uh, are, are twin tracks uh, in their economic approach. Uh, the agrarian reform law removed legal protection from landlords um, who were publicly humiliated and accused of exploitation if they were found guilty, which was usually the case. Their possessions were confiscated and divided amongst the other villagers. Victims were beaten up. They were often executed um, by the villagers themselves, such that by the end of 1951, 10 million landlords had lost their land and one to two million landlords had lost their lives. About 40 percent of land in China had changed hands in that time. By the summer of 1952, 43% of land um, had been distributed to 60% of the population. Remember, this is land being taken away from uh, private landlords and being given to those people who before hadn't owned land but had had to rent it off of them. Um, this was coupled, this redistribution was coupled with, uh, between 1950 and 1952, um, agricultural production increasing 15% uh, each year. But this attack on landlordism was only the first step of reform in the countryside. The Communist Party wanted to go further than that to install uh, or create, mould a communist society and therefore implemented a, a steps, stages, um, several policies to move China towards collectivization. Collective farms, of course, what we're talking about there are farms that are managed by the state, which takes over the ownership of land. So there's no more private land um, and equipment and supplies the peasants with food and accommodation in return for their labour. So they're kind of like turning agriculture into um, the pattern that you might see in industry. Mao had seen how this process had worked in the 1930s under Stalin, but he had seen that actually the, um, the speed at which Stalin had tried to do things had created a lot of uh, dislocation in the Soviet Union. And so Mao said this must be a more gradual process in China, which might take 15 years and we'll kind of take it step by step. So the first step in 1951 was to introduce mutual aid teams. This is where um, groups of around 10 or so families were encouraged to form mats, mutual aid teams. Now they could pool their labor, their animals and their equipment, but they retained the right of private ownership. These, um, this was managed by a peasant association and uh, membership of these associations or these teams was voluntary, um, but there was pressure uh, put upon people to join them and you might find it hard to get hold of resources if you didn't join them. But nevertheless, um, there it was still voluntary at this stage. In 1952, that was accelerated forward into what called the Agricultural Producers Cooperatives or the APCs. Um, successful mats were encouraged to, to combine together and form these APCs of around 40 or 50 families. So around four or five uh, mats would get together um, and in the APCs, land could be pooled and consolidated into larger farming units. 
which is more efficient uh, in terms of its farming than the traditional strips of land. And families with larger holdings could still keep some land for personal use and the rest was rented to the APC. Profits were then shared out at the end of the year according to how much you'd put in, how much uh, resources you contributed and how much had been produced. But this was less popular amongst the peasants and uh, by the by March 1955, only 14% of rural households were in the APCs. Um, Mao was quite frustrated by that, let that be known. And so local officials rushed into pressuring people into joining more APCs. And this um, acceleration of process meant that they were poorly planned. Some APCs went into debt, so they'd borrowed money to buy equipment. Um, and so Mao um, lobbied by Zhou Enlai and Lu Xiaoqi, um, talked about having a slowdown um, in 1953. Uh, and I know that date is before um, Mao's frustration, but they said 1953, a slowdown, things stabilised in 1954, and then there was renewed uh, pressure to join the APCs. But as I said, it, it wasn't popular. When, it, when peasants joined the APCs, they often slaughtered their animals before taking them in rather than sharing them. Um, and the 1954 harvest was so poor that the government had to requisition grain to feed the cities. In 1955, therefore, Mao calls a stop to the whole thing, or a temporary halts the whole thing, um, which he called stop, contract and develop. Um, and for the next 18 months, there was no further development or acceleration of APCs. However, uh, in the summer of 1955, Mao got back uh, into collectivization and decided to go all out for it this time. He announced at a conference of local party secretaries and that would start immediately. And from there being 17 million households in APCs um, at that stage in July 1955, um, there were 75 million by January 1956. So that's uh, going from 17 to 75 million in six months. By the end of 1956, only 3% of peasants were farming as individuals. Uh, the official reason given this was that uh, the peasants themselves were um, asking for it, but actually it was about controlling the peasants and ensuring a supply of food to the cities, which themselves were expanding in the drive for industrialization. Um, so by the December 60, sorry, by December 55, 63% of peasant families were in an APC uh, and 4% were in an HPC. Uh, whereas by January 1956, it was 80% in an APC and 31% in an HPC. These were the bigger units, the HPCs, that consisted of two to three hundred household families. Um, in an HPC, uh, peasant families no longer owned the land or the equipment uh, or the profits, and the profits at the end of the year were shared out according to work points. Um, uh, uh, rather than um, material contributions. Uh, it was work points based on how much labour you'd contributed. And that was an end basically to privately owned land, except in very small plots by 1956. Uh, peasants joined these cooperatives because they were under massive pressure from the party, but also for financial reasons. Because the banks had been nationalised in 1949, they wouldn't lend money to uh, any individual peasants or smaller cooperatives who stayed outside of them. Ideologically, this was a tremendous success for Mao. Um, and if you think about um, success or failure, it's an ideological success, success, ideological success without any doubt. Uh, the state now owns the, the means of production by the mid 50s and the land on which 90 percent uh, of the population are living. And the process of carrying out these changes also increased local party control and it demonstrated Mao's ability um, to get things done uh, as leader of, of China, even against um, opposition of, of people within the party, like Zhou Enlai and Liu Xiaoqi, who I mentioned earlier. It also uh, changed the relationship of peasants to the Communist Party. The peasants had kind of been the engines of, uh, of the revolution and the civil war and great allies of the Communist Party, but now they're seen as servants of the party and servants of China um, rather than comrades. Uh, I'd say also that the speed at which these changes happen in the mid-50s um, adds uh, or makes Mao dangerously overconfident. And that's what you see the problems coming in the second uh, five-year plan, the Great Leap Forward, which we'll look at later on. Economically, and the first uh, period of the fi first five-year plan from um, 52 through 57, food production increased by 3.8% uh, a year. Um, this was 
uh, not enough to sustain the growing industrial workforce, which was expanding even quicker. Um, and the problem seems to be that, that yields per hectare, um, which is a great agricultural phrase, yields per hectare were quite high, but labour productivity was low and, crucially, the amount of land being cultivated per head of the population was also low. The situation was also worsened by a lack of state investment in agriculture um, and probably the fact that the peasants no longer benefited uh, from the work that they put in. So between 1949 uh, and 1957, um, how much had changed? Uh, the answer would be uh, an enormous amount, that the peasants had gone from uh, being landless to owning the lands that they had on through the agrarian reform law and then kind of back to being part of these uh well landless again but being part of these massive communes so the whole way in which agriculture was delivered in china had been changed ideologically therefore and structurally huge change and a great success somehow because by the end of it he's molded a communist way of running agriculture in china the success is less obvious when you look at yields and you know, how much is being grown, uh, because although it does increase, it doesn't increase um, as much as China needed it to. And that uh, is the weakness of the system. Next time, uh, we'll think about the next phase uh, of agricultural um, change, and that is uh, the, communes, the communes and then the, the Great Famine uh, at the end of the 50s. See you then.